Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're really excited to have our next speaker here today. Uh, although he needs no introduction, he's been in the Macintosh system and server administration space for 18 years, uh, most recently at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. You may also know him from his uh, widely read blog, Der Flounder. Uh, please welcome uh, Rich Troughton to the stage. And you can tweet your questions for Rich at hashtag JNUC2016Doc. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know I'm up against uh, some stiff competition with the VPP and DEP panel. Um, so thank you for coming. Also, thank you for showing up early the morning fall of the Brits Pub parties, because I know, you know that had to be rough for a few people. So. Uh, before we get started, there's two things I'd like to mention. Uh, the first is that all the slides in the speaker's notes are available for download, and I'll be providing a link at the end of the talk. I tend to be one of those folks who can't keep up with the speaker and take notes at the same time. So for those folks in the same situation, there's no need to take notes. Everything I'm going to be covering is going to be available for download. And the second is to please hold all questions until the end. I mean, there's the hashtag, JNUC2016Doc. Um, so if you've got questions, Tweet, uh, tweet them at us uh, or talk with me afterwards. Uh, with talk, I'll be able to answer most of your questions during the talk itself. So, my document. It's a lot of work, especially if you're someone who doesn't write a lot. Well, one reason for me is that I like to take vacations. So, here's a picture from one I took a few years ago. So, 90% of the time, this was my view. My glorious, beautiful, thousands of miles from anywhere view. So my internet connection was both slow and expensive, which focused my priorities towards using my expensive internet time to post photos to Facebook and away from checking my work email. And it was possible for work to have called me on the boat, but as you can see, the cost would have likely pushed whatever problem work was having from call him right now to this can wait. So one of the reasons why this worked is that I left behind documentation covering what to do in case of emergencies, as well as day-to-day -day tasks. In fact, as I was riding the airport shuttle on my way to a similar trip, I got a call from my workplace where the person calling said that they had a power outage at our main data center. I was gone, my alternate was stuck in traffic, what should they do? I said, can you find the Mac server rack? Yes, they'd found it. Do you see the packet marked emergency server uh, startup and shutdown procedure? Yes, they did. Okay, open that and start reading. It is gonna walk you through the process. So I talked with them for a few more minutes, make sure that they were okay, and then I said goodbye, and then I ended the call. So without that packet attached to the front of the server rack, which I had made sure was current as of the day before, um, I might have been trying to walk someone through the process of shutting down 15 servers and 12 RAID arrays over the phone, up until the moment that the flight attendant yanked the phone out of my hand because the plane needed to take off. That's why I documented. So everyone's memory is fallible. Moreover, Murphy's Law practically guarantees that you're most likely to forget things when it's important that you need to remember them. And it's also a lot easier to teach something to someone when you have it well documented. So hopefully that will save you um, on people asking you about the same thing repeatedly, which will conserve your time for other things, yeah, hopefully. So now that we've discussed why you should be documenting, let's discuss when you should be writing documentation. So documentation of certain processes and procedures at your workplace may be required by law or by a policy at your workplace. So in these cases, you must document to make sure that you're in compliance. So check your common day-to-day uh, -day processes to see if the available documentation covers your common situations. So for example, you generally don't need to write documentation uh, to show someone how to print to the office printer. What may not be documented is how to set up that printer to print legal-sized from the, uh, you know, double-sided from the legal-sized tray. And if you're not available, can others get the job done? So check your regular processes and procedures to see if the available documentation is sufficient to help others get them done in the event that you're not there. After all, even if you get hit by the lottery bus, the job still does need to get done. <laughs> and documentation also allows you a way to com uh, communicate how to properly handle unusual situations. So you may be able to assume that your coworkers know how to hold down the N key on new machines keyboards to nepo a machine from your work's default netboot set. However, do they knew, no, bleh, can't talk. 
Do they know how to handle that new MacBook Pro that isn't booting up? Well, probably not, unless you've documented that they should be using that new non-default netboot set that you built specifically to handle the new laptops. So disaster recovery documentation may fit under documentation that you're required to do. Now, if it isn't, you should still certainly be doing it as part of your business continuity documentation. As I found, disasters happen regardless of whether or not you're in or out of the office. And your disaster recovery plan should also not consist of this. If there is ever a time to get all the details included in your documentation, your disaster recovery documentation is it. So who is the audience for your documentation? Now usually, this can be broken down into three main groups. And that's you, your colleagues, and then there's everybody else. So the documentation that you write for your own use is first and foremost a memory aid. So this kind of documentation can take all kinds of forms, from notes typed into a notebook app, emails that you send to yourself, or information posted to a wiki. Now, in my opinion, this is really the only time you can make assumptions about the knowledge level of the audience. But even there, we all have off days. So the other thing to keep in mind is that the documentation that you write for yourself should have sufficient detail that you can easily turn it into documentation for others. So when writing documentation for your colleagues, you, I think you want to tell them the story of the problem, how that problem got discovered, the implications of the problem, the process you followed when solving the problem, and if appropriate, include where you initially took an incorrect approach and how you recognized and you fixed that. And last, how you solved that problem. So add all the details you can into the documentation, including the commenting code if a script is involved. So here's an example of this from a few years ago. Uh, one of um, our executives where I worked, he was running 1085 at the time and he needed to run an interview over Skype. And so we downloaded the latest version of Skype and we launched Skype and we found this lovely message. Um, so that version of Skype only supported 10.9 and higher. That was not listed on Skype's system requirements page. Where it was listed was on the download page for this new pop-up that you couldn't really link to. So I had to take a screen capture of the entire uh, you know, browser window so I could capture that. Um, and at the time, that was the only place that Skype listed that it was now Mavericks and later. And so I'm walking through the problem. Uh, I'm discussing it with some colleagues. And uh, my colleague, Tim Sutton, said, hey, there is a version of Skype that still works on 10.8. Here's how you can get it. So I provided, included that with uh, my documentation and also provided a shout out to Tim because he did help me solve this problem. Another example is uh, this one. From a few years ago, uh, I had a developer who worked on both uh, Fedora and on OS X. And on uh, Fedora, his network home was mounted to slash home. He wanted to see if he could have a consistent uh, setup for both OS X and Linux, because he had scripts that he was running against his own home directory. And he didn't necessarily want to write it so that you know, on OS X it looked here, and on Linux it looked here. He wanted something consistent. So um, at the time, I didn't know much about slash home. Um, I knew that nothing appeared to be stored in it. I knew it showed up in Etsy Automaster as a mount point. And I knew that Time Machine didn't back it up. But that was really about it. So did some research called Apple Care Enterprise. And along the way, I found out that, yes, uh, what he was looking for was possible with SMB. Uh, that was uh, how we were looking to mount it. So there was a possibility of doing that via SMB. We needed to write it into a different file, Etsy Auto Home. Um, there were also fun password rules that came along with this. So uh, you couldn't have it longer than eight characters. You couldn't have special pass uh, characters in your password. Uh, so there was all kinds of things. But also, you, you had to have the password in the clear. So that wasn't the best idea. Um, so unfortunately, AutoFS on OS X at the time, I, I don't know if this has changed. It didn't support Kerberos authentication, so we couldn't rely on single sign-on to make this work without storing a password. So a better way to have done this might have been with NFS. Um, unfortunately for my user, that wasn't really an option, but if you are looking at a similar situation, I would recommend taking a look at NFS for doing this because, first of all, the, uh, the connection string is simpler, and because NFS uses IP-based authentication, you can uh, leverage that instead of using a password. Um, so walk through the process, and then for those who want even more information about how all this works, I included a, a link for the man page for Etsy Automaster for those who want to dig even further in the event that what I've put, uh, documented hasn't solved their problem yet. So the idea here is not just to tell your colleagues how to solve the problem, but show them how you solved it. 
Because after all, if you can teach them to fish, maybe they can start catching some fish on their own. And even better from your perspective, maybe they'll start bringing some of these fish back to you and solving problems so that you don't have to. And also, one thing I hear again and again is, why should I document this? Nobody's gonna read this except me. When I hear that, I know at least one person is gonna be reading that documentation, and that is you. So treat your future self right. Make sure to document the process you are following, because walking back through the process may help you get back into the mindset you were in when you wrote the documentation. And for those who wonder if this, this approach works, I've been using it wherever possible for the past few years on my blog, Der Flounder. So for my readers in the audience, can I get a show of hands if you think it is working? Okay. So when writing documentation for outside your circle of colleagues, any assumptions you may have been making about knowledge levels should be immediately discarded. Instead, you should focus on helping the reader figure out if the problem you're covering in the documentation applies to them. If it does, provide a step-by-step -step solution to fix the problem that they're having. Now, if appropriate, include the story of the problem in your documentation. However, that information should go into its own section following the solution. And that way, the user doesn't have to read through it if they don't want to in order to fix the problem. In a case like this, it would be nice if the user received education along the way, but the ultimate goal is to get the user uh, back up and working as quickly as possible. So, here's some, document here's some fun documentation that lives in my knowledge base. Unable to find the user's folder on the hard drive. So problem, I'm unable to find my user's folder on the hard drive. How do I fix this? Solution, please install iTunes 11.2.1 or later to fix this issue. iTunes 11.2.1 or later is available via software update or from iTunes, uh, the iTunes download, download site. Now, in the event that you can't update past iTunes 11.2, I now lead you through this bizarre um, journey where I'm going, I'm turning off Find My Mac, I'm having you download this installer, having you run it, having you reboot it, and after the reboot, verify that you can see the user's folder. I'm not really explaining why any of this is happening. The why happens after the solution. So I don't know how many folks remember this. iTunes 11.2 had a fun bug, which was that if you had uh, 11.2 installed, and Find My Mac enabled, your user's folder disappeared, and the top level became world writable. So what my solution did to fix this was turn off Find My Mac, it needs to stay disabled uh, until you can update to a later, versions of, later version of iTunes. Um, and also the installer that I had them run basically just ran an automated permissions repair, which fixed the, uh, the permissions on the, uh, users, the top level of the user's folder and also ran a change flags command to make the user folder come back again. Weird problem. Um, another example from my knowledge base is after logging in, I'm getting repeatedly prompted to unlock the local items uh, keychain. Um, how can I resolve this? And then right after that, I've got a nice screenshot showing what this looks like. And then after that, I've got a note that this is about the local items keychain not the login keychain. Please see here if you need something for the, uh, the login keychain. So first of all, this is helping them figure out, is this actually my problem? It's not actually my problem. I'm having a problem with the login keychain. Ah, here's the link that you need to fix that problem. And if the problem is with the, uh, the local items keychain, step-by-step -step instructions, how to walk through, get to the library keychain uh, folder inside their own home folder, find the keychains folder, look for something that looks like this, move it to the trash, restart your Mac. And I also let them know that after the restart, you're gonna see a, a similarly named folder appear. That's fine, that's expected behavior. Your problem is actually fixed. So at this point, we've discussed why you should be documenting and the styles you may wanna use when addressing different audiences. So now, let's turn to how you can do this in your own shop. So how to do this breaks down for me into four main areas. There's the process you use to write your documentation, there's the tools you use, there's what I call genericizing, and then there's the media you're using to uh, distribute it. So process is where everybody's gonna be doing it a little differently. For myself, uh, my process of writing documentation involves getting the details down first and screenshotting absolutely every step that I can. So the screenshots I'm getting sometimes don't all go into the final documentation, 
but they are invaluable to me if I need to recreate something later. Now in my process, the overriding initial priority is getting all the raw data that I can. It may turn out that I've gathered something that I don't need after all, but I would rather have it and not need it than the reverse. Because without the details, all the polishing and wordsmithing in the world will not make your documentation better. So my usual process begins like this, where I'm creating a folder where I'm going to store everything related to a particular piece of documentation. Next, I do a dump of all the relevant information into a document, what the documentation will likely be titled, the various components, links to those components, any and all important details. And as mentioned, part of my process is screenshotting as much as I can. So for this, I rely on macOS's built-in capability to take screenshots via keyboard shortcuts. So more often than not, I'm using Command Shift 4 and then clicking on the spacebar to get a camera icon. So once I have the camera icon, I can move it onto a window I want uh, that I want to get a screenshot of and then click the window to make the screenshot. Now if you prefer to save directly to the clipboard, you would add the control key to the keyboard shortcut sequence. And one advantage to this method is that saving screenshots to the clipboard will allow you to paste it directly into a new document. By default, when you take a screenshot of a window with Command Shift 4 spacebar, a drop shadow is added to the image. However, you can turn this drop shadow on or off as you need to. My own preference is to have the drop shadow off. I just think it looks nicer. So to turn on and off the drop shadow, you can use the defaults command in the terminal to edit the screen capture settings for the drop shadow. And in fact, you can use macOS's defaults command to make a number of changes to how screen capture files are saved. So once you've made your changes to the screen capture settings using the defaults command, you'll need to restart the system UE server process. Now, this is the part of the OS that's responsible for doing things like taking screenshots and drawing drop shadows. So to do this, you'd run the kill all system UE server uh, command shown on the screen. And that'll cause it to restart and pick up the new screenshot settings. Now, for those who want to capture screenshots via the command line, macOS also includes a screen capture command line tool. Now, the options for that are shown on the screen. And I know this is small, so just remind everybody, this is going to be available for download later. Now, one particular thing that I found always find funny about this is that this documentation tool has a bug report right in the documentation that better documentation is needed. <laughs> Meanwhile, as proof that merely wishing for better documentation does not make it so, this bug report is apparently still open over 10 years later. <laughs> so when it comes to writing documentation, you'll need at the very minimum a text editor. You may also want to use a graphics editor and a video editor. All these needs are going to have a variety of tools available, and I am not going to tell you which ones to use because everybody's going to have different ones that work well for them. It's also been my experience that people feel very strongly about the right tool to use, so that's another reason I'm not going to tell anybody what tool to use. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to tell you about the tools that I use. So for text editing, I use Apple's Text Edit or Barebone Software's Text Wrangler. For my graphics editing, I normally just use Apple's Preview as it has what may be a surprising number of options when it comes to editing screenshots. When I'm shooting video, I use an application called Screeny that I purchased from the Mac App Store uh, to take screen capture videos, and then I use Apple's QuickTime Pro to edit them. So Preview in particular is an indispensable tool for me. So while most folks don't use it for more than you know, viewing PDFs or viewing images, it's also got a lot of uh, options available for editing and refining images as well. So to access its versatile array of tools, you'd open uh, a file in preview and then click on the Edit Toolbar button, and that has a toolbox icon in Sierra. So among its various tools is the ability to crop images to remove unwanted details from a screenshot. The Instant Alpha tool in preview can be used to remove unwanted backgrounds. And preview can also edit images to add things like shapes and text. <coughs> So this only scratches the surface for how useful Preview has been for me. Um, for a more in-depth tutorial, I encourage you to check out the link on the screen. Now another tool that I've come to rely on is Screeny, and this is a simple to use application for creating screen capture videos. And among the reasons I like it is that it reports the QuickTime movie files, it has simple controls, and it allows me to select how much of the screen I want to record. Now this has been especially useful for me because it allows me to record what's happening in a virtual machine and keep a tight focus on just the parts that I want to include in the video. 
So as an added bonus, since I bought it via the App Store, I can install it anywhere I need to. And another important my, uh, documenta uh, documentation method is what I call genericizing. Now this is the fine art of removing as much specific identifying information from your documentation as possible, while hopefully still making it clear what you mean. So a good example of this is creating a user account that's just named username and having the computer be named computer name. And one other thing I'd like to do is to remove path names in the event the directory path that I'm referring to in the documentation is going to be different for everyone. So a good example of that is when I'm referring to a directory path that will likely include the person's username, since that's really going to be different for everybody. So instead, I'll replace the actual path with path and two. So when writing the documentation, it's often useful to have an actual directory structure uh, correspond to that. So I will create a, a folder out on the root called path and then a, a folder inside of it called true. So the reason I do this is twofold, and it's to accommodate two different groups of people. Uh, folks who are experienced with computers should be able to look at that and just automatically substitute in whatever values they need to. Folks who are not experienced with computers but they do blindly follow directions that they find on the internet will get filed not found errors instead of potentially wrecking their machines. I may have gotten a few emails. <laughs> so another method I've developed is to name things for their expected result. So a good example of that is uh, this screenshot that I took for a tool I developed called First Boot Package Install. So in this case, I was documenting that I'd added error logging to display information on installations that had failed. So to help demonstrate the new logging, I built two installers. The first was named Failed Install, and it contained a deliberate problem with it to make sure that the installer tool would report failure. The other one was named successful install, and it was designed to work just fine. So when I went to take the screenshot, failed install showed an installation failure, and successful install showed as having succeeded. And all this genericizing is generally a lot of work to do in advance. So what I've been doing is leveraging automation for this whenever I can. So I'm using deployment tools like uh, Deploy Studio with virtual machines and uh, setting up workflows that'll help me quickly configure that virtual machine uh, with the configuration, the tools, and everything else that I need to have with, uh, with me. So I can spin up a VM, it'll have the usernames, computer names, other settings that I need to make the screenshots and screen capture videos I want when I need them, and that allows me to generate documentation very quickly because I know exactly what I'll be getting into when I launch that virtual machine. Now last but not least, documentation has to be posted somewhere. Hopefully not in this fashion. So as with creating documentation, there are a number of tools used to post electronic documentation. Um, so for my own shop, I'm using a Confluence Wiki and a SharePoint site to post internal documentation. Uh, my blog is hosted up on WordPress.com, so of course I'm using WordPress there. And in those instances where I'm not posting to either a wiki or a blog, um, my usual tool is to use Microsoft Word to write it and format it, and then use uh, Mac OS's built-in PDF creation tools to create a PDF of it. So that way I have the documentation that I wrote in Word available in both Word and PDF format. So in the last case where I'm writing it up in Word, why am I also making a PDF? Well, the reason is twofold. First, I know that all platforms are gonna be able to read that PDF, as PDF viewers are available for every modern operating system. Second, because PDFs encapsulate not just text, but also the images, fonts, and formatting, I know that the person receiving the PDF will be able to read it exactly the way that I wrote it. That's not an assumption I can make about someone who receives a Microsoft Word document from me. So, now that we've looked at the ways to address different audiences and create documentation for each, how can we apply this to documenting our Casper setup? So in large part, this is gonna be documentation where the audience is gonna be yourself and your colleagues. So this does not mean that there will not be user-facing documentation involved, but it's likely gonna be in the minority. So what should you be documenting here? Well, everyone's gonna have different needs, but the main areas I would recommend concentrating on are the following. Client management, JSS management, policy management, and software management. So for client management, document how you're building your Casper agent installers, how those agents are being deployed, how you can tell if they're working normally or not, and also how to uninstall your Casper agents as needed. So for building Casper agents, here's an example of documentation I wrote up for my colleagues uh, for using Casper Recon to uh, build a quick add package for our production Casper server. So I walked them through the process of open recon. If uh, you're not already set up to talk to my Casper production server, here's how you get that in. Um, here's how you log in. Here's the settings that I want for that quick add package. 
tell them the naming scheme that I expect from my quick add package, tell them exactly what buttons to hit, show them exactly what it should look like when it's creating the quick add package, and last but not least, show what the end result looks like. And for verifying if things work, I have my Casper check solution uh, deployed on each Casper managed machine in my environment. So the full documentation on this is about 11 pages long, but here's page one to give you an idea of how it is structured. So I've also written separate documentation for how to install Casper check and how to uninstall Casper check in my environment. And rather than try to include all, everything into one monstrous document, I just link to it because those, those can stand on their own in case they're needed uh, and I can just bring them in and link them in as I need to. And documentation does not need to be long in order to be effective. So in the case of the documentation for uninstalling the Casper agent, I've linked back to Jamf's documentation on it, as well as providing the necessary command in the documentation. Now for JSS management, document the various automated and manual functions that are used to set up, maintain, upgrade, and backup your JSS. So here's an example of how your JSS backups can be documented. So Jamf already did a lot of the documentation like work for you. There's no need to reinvent that wheel. So the main thing to document here is to record what's captured in your database backup, when those backups are scheduled to run, and where you're storing them. So from there, I've linked back to Jamf's documentation on how to backup the database and where stored as needed, both um, using the uh, you know, JSS database utility and also how to do it from the command line. <coughs> Manually flushing the uh, database logs is a maintenance task that Casper admins need to run at least periodically. So I wrote up some documentation for my colleagues in the event that I'm not there, uh, showing how to perform this task. So showing them where to go, go to management settings, go to log flushing, show them exactly what buttons they need to hit, show them the settings that I'm normally using. In this case, uh, I want to flush logs older than one week. I want to select everything, and then finally hit the flush button. And last but not least, I'm showing them what it should look like when it's all completed so they don't have to wonder. And the, for those with uh, Casper servers, you either host yourself, either you know, up in the cloud or on your own premises, having a documented checklist for upgrading it uh, can be an invaluable aid to make sure that that upgrade process goes smoothly. So here's an example one uh, for a Casper server running on a Linux VM. Um, in my case, I've got it broken down into what's going on on particular days. Uh, first thing I do since mine's running on a Linux VM, I email my uh, VMware administrator to say, hey, would you mind making a snapshot of this? I'm, make, I'm upgrading the... Uh, the server software tomorrow. I just want to make sure I can roll back in case of a problem. Here's the identifying information for that VM. Thanks. Usually I'll get back an email saying, done. Um, day of the upgrade, purge all the uh, Casper database logs older than one week. That's where I can uh, send my colleagues back to the documentation on how to flush logs in case they're not familiar with the process. Um, verify that last night's automated database backup ran. And then right before the upgrade, make yet another database uh, you know, backup just to make sure that in the event that something went wrong, I have something that is very fresh that I can roll back to. I also have uh, Tomcat monitoring running, so I have as part of this that I need to edit the root cron tab to turn off that monitoring. And also I have a note saying the reason to turn it off is that I don't want it restarting Tomcat in the middle of the upgrade process. And last but not least, just to make sure that uh, you know, everything is flushed out, there's no cruft remaining, I just reboot my production uh, Casper server. So run the upgrade process. Um, this is usually a checklist that I'm following, so I've got kind of the 10,000 foot view, um, but I refer back to the JSS installation and configuration guide for Linux, just in case it's a colleague running it. Um, once the upgrade is completed, once again, I go back into the root cron tab, turn my Tomcat monitoring back on. And then following the upgrade, I have documented what my tests are. Uh, get a selection of machines, make sure they're updating to the uh, new agent, have them run a recon to make sure they're communicating properly. Um, create a new Casper agent install for use with Casper check. Post it to the new location. Well, post it to the location you're posting your uh, you know, Casper check quick add to. Um, if for colleagues who are following this documentation, I made sure to include here's where it is, here's what you need to do to make sure it's working properly. Uh, verify that it's working. And here I'm linking back to documentation that shows how to verify the Casper check is working properly. Um, Add it to Deploy Studio, since we're using that for setting up new machines, I'm adding the new Casper agent installer to that. And then on a test machine that I've verified has the uh, agent installed, the updated agent installed, open self-service, run a few tasks, make sure everything is working properly. 
and assuming that a colleague is going to be following this, I have as the very last step to say, if everything's worked successfully so far, you can stop now. You're done. Now, for, if you're looking for additional models for this, there are other Casper upgrade checklists available. And this is one posted to Google Docs by Jamf Nation's Casper Sally. Now, documenting your policy management may be a challenge, since a number of your JSS policies will likely change frequently. So the best way to document these changes, in my opinion, is to use automated tools whenever possible to pull information from your Casper server and have those tools handle generating your policy management documentation. So fortunately, in many cases, you can leverage the API for this to pull out the information that you need. So Mike Morales has uh, built and posted a number of scripts for downloading useful information about your policies and other areas from your Casper server and then assembling them into reports. And he's been good enough to post them to GitHub for anyone to use. So when you're pulling information via the API with Mike's scripts, you'll need to provide a username and password as well as the address of your JSS. So in my case, the account I'm using to access the API is one that I created for this specific purpose, and it has the least privileges necessary to access the desired information. So let's take a look at how this works. So I'm going into Terminal. I'd already downloaded a copy of uh, Mike's script. And I'm just going to go ahead and run Create JSS Policy Scope Report. And it's logging into my JSS, pulling all that information down. Going to go ahead, create a report, put it in a CSV format. Mike's even nice enough to open up a new finder window for me to show exactly where it is. You go double click on it, opens up in Excel. Yeah, I could make that look a little nicer. All right, so let's uh, change the column width there. And there you go, there's your report. Shows you what's your policy, what's your ID, does it apply to all machines? If it doesn't apply to all machines, what does it apply to? All kinds of information. Did I have to write up any of this? No, just pulled it straight from my JSS. So another tool that can query your Casper server via the API is Shea Craig's Spruce Utility, which generates reports on the objects in your JSS that aren't being used, are obsolete, or should otherwise be cleared off in your system. And those reports can then be used to document what you've now removed from your JSS, which leads us into change management. Now, for those who aren't familiar with change management, it is the practice of using a standardized method and process for making changes to your system, with the goal being to minimize the impact of change-related incidents, both for your customers and for yourselves. So as part of your change management process, you should be tracking and documenting the changes which are being made. And what a really easy way to get started is to use your existing ticket system to track your changes. So for example, this is a ticket from a little while ago where Firefox 48 came in via auto package. Um, auto package built a uh, new Firefox 48 installer for me. And I linked to the documentation basically for anyone who's reading it. This is what auto package is. Here's my documentation on how I have auto package set up. Do the 10,000 foot view of uh, my testing, where I brought it into a VM, set it up, made sure everything is working. Um, once uh, my deploy studio and Casper tester was done, moved those into production, uh, updated my documentation that I have for my standard deployment configuration, since I have Firefox listed on there. Uh, this is something that I published for my entire shop to see so everyone can see exactly what goes into uh, my Mac configurations. Um, last but not least, I have a note here that I've updated Yammer. And what I'm doing there is that to help with the signal to noise ratio, since my ticket system is used for a lot more than change management, I also post a brief description and a link to the ticket to our help desk change management Yammer group. So this allows uh, my management and the rest of my team to quickly see what's changed uh, and also give them the option to click the ticket link if they want more details. So as you can see, what I post to Yammer is actually pretty short. Firefox 48 is now in Casper and Deploy Studio. You want more details, click on the link. Short, sweet, but if my management needs to look up later and say, when did we add Firefox 48, they can search through it either through Yammer or through the ticket system. Another thing that you, have to do, uh, that you should be documenting is your software management. And uh, for me, that's largely manual package building and automated package building. So as an example of documentation that I've written for uh, manual package building, I have an application called DNA Star um, that does not call, come with a standard Apple installer package. Instead, it's one of those folks that decided that they were gonna build an installer application. Fortunately, their installer application does come with command line switches, so I can run it from the command line. And so what I do is basically I build an installer package, 
I stuff the installer app application inside of it, and then I use a script to run the installer application. So for this, I'm walking through the process. I'm telling my colleagues, what are the prerequisites for this? And then once they uh, have packages, the latest DNA star installer, and everything else that's needed, I then walk through the process step by step of building the installer. So go through, show them exactly what they should expect to see when building the installer. Here's a script that I'm using uh, to basically, this is a post install script that runs. Um, as you can see, I have to do a lot of things to have DNA start run properly, like fix permissions. Um, and also, it tries to stick a log into uh, slash applications. So what I do is I basically just have that information sent straight to var log install.log, and then I get rid of the log that DNA star is trying to put into applications. Last but not least, I show what the final product should look like in uh, my packages project. I walk, th you know, walk through building it, refer them as needed to the uh, relevant part of the package uh, help manual, and also give them instructions on how do you test this. You take it to a machine that doesn't have uh, this version of DNA star installed, launch it, did everything work? Since wherever possible, I, I like to have robot minions do my work for me. Um, I also document how I'm doing my automated package building. And for this, I'm leveraging auto package and auto packager. So in my documentation, I have a list of everything that I'm running through with uh, auto package these days. Uh, that I have a machine set up to run auto package. Talk about what the username UID for it is. That I have auto packager running in it. Give descriptions on where those installers are located on the virtual machine that I'm running this from. Um, that say that auto package is set to run hourly, so it runs, it runs its auto package run every single hour. When it finds new stuff, I get an email. Walk through the settings for JSS importer, because this is how I get it up to my JSS. And last but not least, just in case that everything has gone completely wrong and we're building from scratch, I even have documented uh, my Casper API a user that I have stored up on my JSS uh, that Auto Packager is using to communicate with my JSS and upload my packages. So getting into the habit of documentation has helped me immensely in many ways. And being able to help others through what I've documented has been very rewarding, both personally and professionally. So if you've been inspired to start documenting all the things, hopefully I've now equipped you with some ideas and tools that are going to help you to do so. And finally, I would like to close with a tribute to the fictional character who first got me interested in documentation, and that is Dr. Henry Jones Sr. So Dr. Jones Sr. was extensively thorough when it came to documentation, and that's because he wanted to free up his brain for the grail quest and not have to remember that Saint What's-His-Name liked oatmeal instead of mutton for breakfast. <laughs> Meanwhile, when Indy needed it most, Dad had made sure that all the needed details were in the grail diary. So this allowed Indy to save the day by reading the documentation as well as drawing on his uh, knowledge of their shared field. I posted a few links during this uh, presentation, but these are going to be the most important links you see, because this is how you get it all. Uh, PDF is available from the top link, and keynote slides, which include the demos, which include the speaker's notes, which include absolutely everything that I've been talking about, they're available from the link below. And I'm going to leave that up on the screen, and uh, how much time do we have for questions? Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you so much. That was great. All right, we have time for just a few questions. If you have a question, feel free to tweet it using the hashtag JNUC2016Doc. Uh, one of the questions that came up was, how do you document JSS passwords, MySQL, Jamfadmin, or system accounts that you may not use every day? Um, for that, I would actually recommend using a password manager rather than trying to put that directly in uh, the documentation, and then include in your documentation a little blurb saying, if you need the password for this, it is stored here. Um, and, you know, and include as much detail as you can, you can, because chances are if someone needs the password and it's not you, chances are that they're in a hurry. So help them out as much as possible. Great. And then uh, someone had a question of how you incorporate documentation activities into your daily work. Do you have a sacred time set aside for it? Uh, I do not. Um, this is actually where having the documentation VMs comes in very handy because it allows me to just uh, quickly turn around, get the screenshots and the screen capture videos and write up everything that I need to. So, Also, I have a very uh, generous employer 
who is generous uh, with both time and resources. So um, they're usually pretty good about giving me the time that I need. That's always helpful. Uh, we had another question come in. How did you create the command boxes in your documentation? The command boxes. There's a picture. Oh, that is, um, that I took that, so that's from SharePoint, uh, which does not have a native built-in syntax editor. However, um, there is a site called highlight.me, that's H-I-L-I-T-E dot me. And what it'll do is if you, you just need to select the language that you want to uh, create um, like a syntax edited version for, and it'll spit out the proper HTML for it. I found it very invaluable with SharePoint. Um, Confluence has that capability built in natively, so I didn't have to use Highlight for me for that, but for SharePoint, it's just saved me a ton of time. Great. Do you use any special tools for injecting timestamps, et cetera? Injecting timestamps. Injection timestamps? Um, I can clarify. Oh, yes, great. please. I noticed, for example, you had like a little timestamp in your service tickets of when or at what time you had done something. And so I'm just curious if you have like a, a test expander or something that puts in a timestamp. Oh, no. That's built into our help desk ticketing system. So that's kind of built in. As soon as I save the ticket, it timestamps it with when it got created. So unfortunately, that's not something I can share. That's something. Uh, that we built into our ticket system. We also custom built our ticket system. Don't custom build your ticket systems. <laughs> and I think you already mentioned this, but what do you use for screen and video grabs? Um, for that, I use uh, an application called Screeny, which, uh, like I said, I get, I get it from the App Store. Also, uh, QuickTime 10 um, has a, a free screen capture recording thing that uh, you can, that's installed on every Mac and you can leverage that. I think the main thing is that you'll just have to see a little timer tickering away somewhere in your screen while you're uh, making your screen capture video. Um, I'm not sure of a way to suppress that. Um, which one, screeny or the, uh, for that, if I may? Yeah. So if you go to, quick time. There's an option here for new screen recording. In, oh, if in QuickTime Player, there's that's an option not showing for up on the new screen, is file it? new screen recording. So let me. There we go. So new, file new screen recording. And uh, if you search on my blog, Dear Flounder, I even have a, a I have a post on how to use that and also how to use it to capture another screen. So in the event that you're doing something like this. Uh, where you're doing a presentation where the slides are off on the other display and your presenter's notes are on your primary display, you can capture what's going on on that second display and not worry about what's showing up over here on your, uh, pr on your presenter display. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for attending this session. And Rich, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Okay.